Are you ready for some word today? Amen. All right, I'll meet you in the Gospel of Mark today. I've been, been just marinating over the Gospel of Mark for several months now. We've been covering this book in our podcast since the top of the year and just working our way slowly through the Jesus stories laid out in what was probably the first gospel penned was the Gospel of Mark. Um, probably uh, around the fall of the temple in Jerusalem, although it, some scholars have it as early as the 50s that Mark penned his gospel, but almost definitely the first written account of Jesus I only say that because when you read the Gospels, you're going to read accompanying stories. Sometimes Matthew's going to tell the same story Mark tells. Luke's going to tell the story. But they're going to tell it a little differently. And of course, that's um, to be expected when people are writing the same story from years away and from different perspectives. But I choose Mark's Gospel in this because Mark lays things out in a very interesting narrative style. I want to read for you the third of three Jesus confrontations that happen inside the same chapter. Jesus is confronted by Pharisees, Sadducees, and scribes back to back to back in Mark 12. Now, we don't know that for sure it happened that way. One day, a bunch of Pharisees come and get in an argument with Jesus, and the second they're done, a bunch of Sadducees. It seems a little dramatic. Mark tries to present it that way so that we can see Jesus sort of parrying blows at different, on different theological fronts. But a bunch of Pharisees asked Jesus about should they pay their taxes. And while I wish Jesus would have said no, he says, render to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. You know the story. And so I got to be a faithful disciple of Jesus. I know that's the moments when we don't want to follow Jesus. Uh, then the Sadducees come to Jesus and say, a guy got married, a woman marries a, a man and then he dies before they have a kid. And according to the law of Moses, his brother marries her and he dies before they have a kid. And then his brother marries her and he dies. And it's this comical story where seven men marry the same woman and none of them have a child with her. And they get to the end and sort of elbow themselves and go, which one of them is she married to in the resurrection, Jesus? And you can see their sarcasm because they don't believe in the resurrection. And so Jesus, of course, has to say, you don't understand the thing that you're asking. The dimension you're talking about doesn't have marriage in the way you have marriage. You're asking things above your pay grade. In other words, you're asking for a dimension you can't quite understand. And then he's confronted by a scribe. And when you see the word scribe, some translations will say lawyer. And all that really means is a guy who has spent his life studying Torah. Torah for us Christians would sometimes be called Pentateuch. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, the first five books of the Bible, also called the, the book of Moses. But for a Jew, and Jesus is a Jewish man living in first century temple Judaism, they have what would be Moses or Torah, and they have scribes who spend their lives poring over the words of Torah because they don't have the, this. They don't have the printed version of what you might call the Bible laying on their shelf at home. They can just go to and consult and see what Moses said. If they want to know what Moses said, they go to a scribe. The scribe not only has the scriptures, but knows how to read them which is pretty rare in that day. And so the scribes spend their lives pouring over the text and a scribe comes to Jesus and once again, probably a little tongue in cheek, a little sarcastically, he comes to a carpenter from Galilee who never went to formal school or at least to higher education and says to him, what is the greatest or the first commandment? Mark chapter 12, verse 28. He's heard them reasoning together and perceiving. He says, which is the first commandment of all? This is a scribe asking Jesus, hey, what's the biggest commandment? What's the best commandment? What's the first commandment? And the reason I say he's a little tongue in cheek, he's a little sarcastic is because he's the guy who's living is to read these scriptures. He's the guy you go to to get this question answered. He brings the question to Jesus. You can almost feel it dripping in sarcasm. Like, hey, you, you're out here, people think you're a great teacher. People are talking about how you are a God's man and you know how to heal and you're doing miracles. So let me ask you a scriptural question. What's the first commandment of the law? And it, I, I think he really thinks he's probably thrown a pretty slick curveball at Jesus. What is the first commandment of all the commandments? And actually, if we didn't know what was coming, or if, or if our minds were in a different place, you could probably ask a lot of Christians this, and they might whiff on this pitch. 
what's the first commandment of all? Or what's the most important thing? Particularly if you watch the news or you watch social media and you find out what Christians are talking about, it's very doubtful they'd land on Jesus' answer. Because I think we think there's a lot of stuff pretty important that we ought to be fighting about, preaching about, screaming about, rioting about, getting mad about, and probably none of it has much to do with verse 29. Jesus answered him, the first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first commandment. And if we stop right there, what has happened is that Jesus has just quoted the Shema. The Shema is the watchword of the Jewish religion, both in the first century and in the 21st century. Even to this day, pious Jews will place their right hand over their eyes twice a day, once in the morning and once before they lay their head down to go to sleep, and they will quote the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your strength, with all of your soul, and with all of your might. And there's more to the Shema, but that's the heart and soul. Those are the words that define Judaism. Jesus, I don't know if he puts his hand over his eyes when he says it, but it's possible if that was a tradition in the first century. And he leans into his own religion, his own faith, and he says the first and greatest thing you could do is love God. Love Him with everything you are. Love Him with your heart, with your soul, with your strength, and with your might. With everything in your being, love God. He goes, that's the very first thing that we are required to do. And then Jesus goes beyond the question because He's Jesus. And He has more to say. And He wants to add something to it. And so He steps outside of the Shema. He steps outside of the answer expected and He adds this in verse 31. And the second is like it is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. And in this, Jesus does something a little odd. First of all, he wasn't asked, hey, what's the top two? He was asked, what's number one? And so Jesus answers number one. He goes, but also, don't forget, number two, just as important, right up there with it, maybe a 1B is you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And he doesn't pray the Shema. He reaches into Leviticus to grab a scripture that's not prayed twice a day by every Jew. And he grabs a scripture from Torah and he implants it right there next to the first commandment. And so here's Jesus doing his own version of cut and paste. I got a little book brewing inside me called Cherry Picking with Jesus. Because I do watch Jesus cherry pick scriptures and cherry picking is not a bad thing if you like cherries. Everybody acts like cherry picking is the worst thing you can possibly do. They must hate cherries. Why is everybody so against cherries? If you're cherry picking, you go after the best cherries. Jesus knew how to pick the best cherries. And I know this because there are times in Jesus' ministry when he goes, you've heard it said, but I say to you. And they're quoting verses at him and he quotes some right back. And this isn't weaponizing the Bible, but it's allowing the Christ that's standing in front of them to preach himself into the scriptures. And so Jesus takes the first and greatest commandment, the Shema, and he goes, love the Lord your God with all your heart, strength, soul, and might, but don't stop there. Here's number two, one B, just as important as the first one, love your neighbor as yourself. So the scribe said to him in verse 32, well said, teacher, you have spoken the truth for there is one God and there is no other but he and to love him with all the heart, with all the understanding, with all the soul, with all the strength and to love one's neighbor as yourself is more than all the whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. And before I give you Jesus' commentary back at the scribe, just pay attention to what the scribe says. First of all, it's just a little funny that he says to Jesus, good job, good answer, Jesus. I've always thought that was a little pretentious. I probably would have kept that to myself. Even if I thought Jesus had gave a good answer, I might keep it to myself and just wait because there's probably a trick coming. You know, like I've been, I've been around him before. He's going to give me like a third one I'm not ready for or something. Uh, but aside from the man saying, hey, good answer, Jesus, it's pretty interesting what he comes up with. Yeah, the Shema is it. Love the Lord, give him everything you got, love your neighbor as yourself. And then he throws this in. That's even more than all the whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. So he throws something else back at Jesus. Not only are those first two commandments important, but it seems to me that they actually are more than the whole sacrificial system, than the whole temple. Then the whole shedding of blood, 
How's Jesus respond to this? When Jesus saw that, he answered, saw that he answered wisely, he said to them, You are not far from the kingdom of God. But after that, no one dared question him. I want to really hone in as a title this morning, Not Far From the Kingdom, because this is a statement that Jesus makes to the scribe that I find to be pretty fascinating. You are not far from the kingdom. What you just said to me, love the Lord your God with everything you are, love your neighbor as yourself, this happens to be more important than burnt offerings and sacrifices. That means it's more important than all that stuff going on. Maybe Jesus gestured to the temple where you could see the smoke coming out of the temple. You could smell the incense and the lamb's blood. And maybe Jesus gestures, because you're right, it's more important to do those two things than it is to do that thing. It's more important than your tithing into that or your lamb sacrifice into that or your attendance to that. To love God and to love your neighbor, Jesus goes, that would be it. And then he throws this in, you're not far from the kingdom if you did that. So before we dig in to what it would mean to be not far from the kingdom, let's clean some stuff up because I think we got some bad ideas about, first of all, about the kingdom. Because for most people, the, when Jesus talks about kingdom of God or kingdom of heaven, we have the idea of a far off place called heaven that someday we go to when we die. And we are out here as Christians presenting the gospel as an invitation to come join us who've got it right so that when you die, you can go to the kingdom. Okay, if that definition isn't good enough, let me clean it up even more. I'll simplify it. We've presented the gospel as an invitation to get right or get left, to turn or burn, to get ready to go home when you die, to miss hell and go to heaven, to go off to a far off place where Jesus is currently in carpenter mode, running around building mansions just over in the glory land, his cosmic tool belt at his side, and he's hammering away at all new convert housing, and he's adding on to people who are praying and anointed and giving, and he's making their mansions bigger and bigger, and he's building dog houses for their dead pets, and he's leveling out grass, and he's putting in ponds, and he's stocking it with young fish, and all the things you're going to need for all of eternity. Jesus is working on it. And he's getting really close to being finished. And when he gets finished, he's going to throw his leg up over a white horse. He's going to come back and he's going to take all the people to his cul-de-sac in glory so that you can inherit your house. That's not the kingdom of God. And the reason why that has become the kingdom is because the gospel has become an invitation instead of a proclamation. And it was always supposed to be a proclamation. The gospel is an announcement Good news, the king's here. Am I sure? Well, I'm, I'm as sure as Jesus and John the Baptist kick off their ministry with it. John says, hey, come here. I'll baptize you in water. There's one coming after me. He's going to baptize you in fire. He's more worthy than I am. By the way, here's my message. Repent, the kingdom's at hand. Repent, the kingdom is right there if you want it. How do you get it? Repent. Well, what's repent? Well, that's a great Greek word, metanoia, which means to change your mind. But it doesn't just mean to change the way you think it, it, or, or to change your mind about a subject. It means to change your whole mindset. The Romans used it as a word that meant turn around when you're in formation. If you're marching one direction and they yell at you, repent, turn around and go the other direction. So here's a world on a climactic journey toward a confrontation with Caesar. This is the Jewish world of the first century. A confrontation with Caesar needing a Messiah to get him there. And John the Baptist comes along and goes, repent, change your mind. The kingdom's at hand if you want it. Jesus follows him and preaches the same thing. When Jesus sends his disciples into the local towns and villages and anoints them to preach the gospel, he says, go in and preach the kingdom. What's that mean? Go in and proclaim the king is here. The king has come. The kingdom is here. And if the king has come and the kingdom is here, then you and I get to live out of the kingdom. So the gospel is not just an invitation to come to Jesus. The gospel is a proclamation that Jesus has come to you. Amen. So the gospel is not an invitation to come meet Jesus so you can miss hell and go to heaven. The gospel is a, a proclamation that heaven, the kingdom, has come to us. And that if you would like to enter into that kingdom now, you can by following the king who is alive and well on planet earth. Amen. It's incredible that we believe Jesus is king of kings and lord of lords. How many of you believe Jesus is king of kings and lord of lords? Amen. If he's king of kings and lord of lords, doesn't he have a kingdom? 
And if he has a kingdom, it's not way off in the glory land. He's waiting for you to get there. That means that you are not in the same land as your king. And if you are not in the same land as your king, you are wandering around down here without him. And that bad divorce of the king and his kingdom has caused us to think that, well, we don't really have the king, but we have the Holy Spirit. Here's how people justify this. We don't have the king, but we have the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit's our temporary guide, our aid until the king comes. And what that does is make the Holy Spirit an inferior member of the Godhead who's down here as a temporary placeholder until the real king shows up. And I do not want to insult the spirit of the Holy Ghost, Amen. the Holy Spirit, by assuming that he's the lowest member of the triune Godhead that's just place setting until the king shows up. I am a believer that the king and his kingdom are alive and well right now. And the, the invitation is a proclamation. I invite you to accept the proclamation that the king has come. And you might go, well, what about the rest of the New Testament? Do they believe this? Do they preach this as accessing that kingdom? Well, I, I very much believe that there is incongruency in some of the ways our New Testament writers view some of the principal things of our theology. And I think until we admit that, we get ourselves into trouble as Bible students. Okay, for instance, Paul and James have got some problems with each, with each other's theology. I, am I safe in saying that? I know, I know in some places if you say something like that, they think you're tearing the Bible apart. I don't at all. I think if, if, if there's two people in the world and we both believe in Jesus, we're going to have some inconsistencies in the way we say things. Sure. Right. Now that you should have amen for sure, because I've already said some things that maybe wouldn't be the way you would say them. And so, yes, we're definitely going to, we both serve the same Jesus, but we're going to say things differently. So James and Paul don't always say things the same way. Sometimes they say things that sound exactly the opposite direction. I mean, James talks about that there is no faith without works. Faith without works is dead being alone. Paul says faith can have no works. It's righteousness by faith. It cannot be righteousness by works. And you go, well, which one's right? Well, maybe if they both had a chance to explain themselves, they're both right in their own way. I'll let them fight it out for eternity. <laughs> but I do know that they agreed on the things that sound like Jesus. And for me, that's what matters. And that's what I look for in the world and with people. Where do we agree on the things that look like Jesus? Now, we may disagree with some theological fine-tuning. We may disagree with a verse, where it's placed, how it's read, how you should live it out. But we're both disciples of Christ. Can we agree on how Jesus would love, how Jesus would react, how Jesus navigated the world. That's what makes us who we are. So let me give you an example. Here's James chapter 2, verse number 8. I'm going to read you a James, and I'm going to read you a Paul. I want to show you how much similarities are to the Jesus of Mark 12 so that we can land on a principle sort of watchword theme, what it means to be Christian. James 2, 8. If you really fulfill the royal law according to the Scripture... You shall love your neighbor as yourself, you do well. Now, first of all, the scripture in their day would have been Torah. It's Old, Test Old Testament for us. He doesn't have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So he's not fulfilling the royal law according to the way he saw it in Jesus. He's just simply talking about the way he saw it in scripture. So for him, the fulfillment of the law is what he sees in scripture. And by scripture, he would call what we would call Old Testament. That word royal, if you really fulfill the royal law, is derived from the same Greek word as the word king, which is translated, this is the exact same word in the Greek from Revelation chapter 1, where, we have, where John has a vision of Jesus on the Isle of Patmos in Revelation 1, and he says, He hath made us a kingdom of priests. Remember that? He hath made us a kingdom of priests. Same word. If you really fulfill the royal law, the king's law, the kingdom law, according to Scripture, you'd love your neighbor as yourself. So James agrees with Jesus. A fulfillment of that law would be loving your neighbor. Let's look at Paul. Because Paul, we kind of place in a category sometimes by himself, almost the cranky New Testament scholar. <laughs> he disagrees with everybody else. He's got his own ways. He's got his own way of saying things. And, and we're probably not that wrong about Paul for the most part. But there is a, a beautiful congruency in the way that he sees things about love. Look at Romans chapter 13, verse 8. 
Owe no one anything except to love one another, for he who loves another has fulfilled the law. Now, I'll pause here before I read anything else. A lot of us have the idea, in fact, I heard someone using the cross as an invitation to salvation the other day, and they made this statement in their invitation. I'm not nitpicking invitations, but this kind of stood out at me. And they said, Jesus came to the earth and lived the law perfectly and then died on your behalf, fulfilling the law so you don't have to. And they said, Jesus fulfilled the law so you don't have to, so that he could become your savior. And something inside of me went, okay, I think I get the spirit of that statement, which is Jesus became you and went to the cross as you. So God's not asking you to go to the cross. If that's the statement, I say amen to it. But if by fulfilling the law, we mean Jesus never sinned, and that's usually what we mean, Jesus never sinned and thus fulfilled the law so he could die, the New Testament writers and Jesus don't agree that the law was asking you to be sinless. Fulfilling the law was not living perfect. What did Jesus say? Love the Lord your God, love your neighbor as yourself, not far from the kingdom. James goes, fulfill the royal law, which is love your neighbor as yourself, that would be the whole fulfillment of the law. Paul says, if you love somebody, you've done what? Fulfilled the law. So when Jesus fulfilled the law, how'd he do it? He loved. That everything out of his mouth was the love towards his father and towards his neighbor. He says to his disciples, I don't do anything I don't see my father do. I don't say anything I don't hear my father say. So if my father does it, I do it. So Jesus takes in from his father gives it back out to the world so that every engagement with his neighbor has been prefaced by an engagement with his father so that he knows what his father thinks about him. He knows what his father thinks about you. And therefore, what comes out of Jesus is the love of his father towards you. It is not Jesus loves you, but God's a little ticked off at you. So thank God for Jesus. No, Jesus is the expression of his father. He's showing you what daddy always thought of you, but everything else got in your way from hearing that. Your sin got in the way of you hearing that. Your religion got in the way of you hearing that. Your guilt got in the way of you hearing that. Your preaching, singing, teaching, your testimony, your life got in the way of you knowing the Father loves me just as I am. Jesus is the expression of the Father's love. So Paul goes, if you love one another, you fulfilled the law. Look at verse 9. For the commandments, all right, let's, let's go Ten Commandments on you. We won't even use them all. Let's just use half of them. Paul doesn't even use them in order, which is an interesting selection, which tells me he didn't know them in order, or he did and just thought, well, I'm just going to write them down in the random order. Don't commit adultery, don't murder, don't steal, don't bear false witness, don't covet. Fascinating thing about Paul's usage of the Ten Commandments is that he uses the last five, not the first five. The first five commandments are essentially towards God with mom and dad included, because in the vernacular of God, that's mom and dad. Okay. In the vernacular of Judaism, that's mom and dad. What Paul does quote are the last five, because the last five are really outward commandments, how I treat you and how you treat me. So Paul goes, adultery, murder, stealing, false witness, covet, if there's, if there's any other commandment. So if you got another one that's as important to you as those five, he goes, throw it in. If there's any other commandment, they're all summed up in this saying, namely, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Verse 10, love doesn't harm a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfillment of the law. So Paul agrees with James. That's a shocker. He doesn't do that much. Paul and James agree with Jesus. And they don't even have Mark 12 as a guide because Mark won't be written until they're both dead. But they did. James at least probably walked with Jesus and Paul had his own revelation of Jesus and what he takes away from Jesus that he sees on the road to Damascus is we're supposed to be loving. Now, with all of that wrapped up right there, let me put that on pause for a second. Go back to Mark 12, 34 and take one more look at what Jesus says to the scribe. You are not far from the kingdom of God. A lot of commentators will say about this text, what Jesus means is that this scribe is a salvation away from the kingdom of God. He just needs to put his faith in Jesus and then he would enter the kingdom. But that would have Jesus asking the scribe to do something that's more Paul 
than Jesus. Paul's the one who will come along and preach to us sort of a Romans Road style confession for salvation. Jesus preaches discipleship. Just follow me. Do what I do. You do what I do, you're in. Paul preaches a confess with your mouth of the Lord Jesus, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. And while I don't know that Paul meant for us to turn that into the quote unquote sinner's prayer, and that's how we determine if people are really saved or not, we've done it. I, I think we're, we should be a little closer to the Jesus style, which is, hey, you can say all the right things, but come follow me. Yeah, you, can, you can pray the right prayer, come follow me. Love like me, live like me. That's how you'll know that you're mine. Jesus said, they're going to know you're my disciples because you love one another. It's not they're going to know you're my disciples because you stand up for the good. Because you demand that people live moral lives. Because you fight against sin. Because you're against corruption. He said, they're going to know you're mine because you love people. And in loving people, you're going to look like Jesus. And so... What does it mean then to be not far from the kingdom of God? I don't think what Jesus means is, boy, man, you're close. If you'd just get down on your knees right now and ask me to come into your heart and be your personal Lord and Savior, you'd be in the kingdom. Because that's an anachronistic statement. It doesn't exist in that timeline. Jesus doesn't ask anybody to do that. One time he forgave a guy of his sins who didn't even pray. Jesus shows up in a room. Dude's laying there paralytic. Jesus goes, son, your sins be forgiven you. Guy didn't confess his sins, didn't ask for forgiveness, didn't quote any scripture. Jesus just said, your sins are forgiven. Made everybody in the room mad. As mad as it would make us. Because <laughs> if, if we said to somebody, sins are forgiven, we go, well, he didn't even confess. <laughs> that guy, he didn't even pray the sinner's prayer. We hadn't even filled up the baptistry yet. You can't tell him his sins are forgiven. Jesus doesn't seem to go around the room and go, hey, I'm going to tell this guy his sins are forgiven. What do you think? Thumbs up, thumbs down. Thumbs up, thumbs down. Doesn't take a vote. Just does it because he hears his father who has sent his son on a rescue mission. Amen. The king is on a rescue mission. Find people who are in sin and give them forgiveness. Find people who are hurting and heal them up. Find people who are lost and bring them home. You go get them. You don't wait on them to come to you. No, you go get them. You leave the 99 and you go get the one. You turn that house upside down till you find that coin. You run down to the end of the lane till that kid comes home. And you don't ask them if they're sorry. And you don't ask for sordid details. You show up with shoes and rings and clothes and fatted calves and you throw it all at them so that they know they're welcome back in daddy's house. Amen. So being not far from the kingdom is not, boy, if you just say the sinner's prayer, you'd get it. No. But what it probably means, as far as I can see, is to be not Far from the kingdom is Jesus saying, do that. You know that thing you're saying, love the Lord your God with all your heart, love your neighbor your soul? Do that. That, That's the kingdom. Not far from the kingdom, do that. And that would be the kingdom. If you did that, that's what the kingdom looks like. Not some mansion just over in the glory land. But the Father's house coming into the hell of who people are and where they live and loving them in spite of themselves and loving them even though they aren't worth it and even though they haven't earned it and even though they don't deserve it, loving them anyway because that's the rescue mission Daddy sent me on. He said, go do that. That would show you what the insides of the kingdom look like. You're good at studying from afar and quoting Scripture, but if you did it, you'd see it. If you did it, you'd live it out. To this same trilogy of people, scribes, Pharisees, Sadducees, Matthew chapter 23 has Jesus with this long diatribe against haughty religion. Let me give you a couple of those moments. Matthew 23, 13. Woe, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites, you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men, for you don't go in yourselves, nor did you allow those who are entering to go in it. Now, for those of you who are wondering if I've got any other scriptural proof that the kingdom is not a far off place called heaven, Matthew 23, 13, to me, if the kingdom of heaven is a far off place called heaven, Jesus thinks scribes and Pharisees can actually keep people from going to heaven. Going to a place called heaven when they die. That another human being could keep you from going to a place called heaven when they die. I don't think that's what Jesus is saying at all. 
Jesus is saying, you've shut up access to this kingdom, to people, and you're not going in either. This sounds much like Mark chapter 12 where Jesus says to the scribe, you're not far from the kingdom. Just go in. Just do it. Just turn. But what has happened in the religious world of that day is that access to the heart of God has been clouded by religious performance. That it takes sacrifice. It takes moral code living. It takes performance and perseverance in order for you to enter the kingdom. And Jesus has come along and said, no, it's none of the stuff you do in relation to works that gets you into the kingdom. But it's following the Jesus that is the king in the kingdom and then going in. And to, for further proof, go 10 verses later in verse 23 where Jesus says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees. And I encourage you to read Matthew 23. It's a whole chapter of woe. Woe, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. You pay tithe of mint, anise, and cumin. But you've neglected the weightier matters of the law. Justice, mercy, faith. These you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. In this text, the scribes and Pharisees remind me so much of us in the context of religion, which is do the right thing, say the right thing, perform the right thing. And Jesus says, that's not how you get into the kingdom is saying and doing and performing. He says, why would you neglect the weightier matters of the law? We live in a culture a church culture that seems relatively obsessed with how everybody else is living their lives. I actually was naive enough to believe when I was a little younger that maybe we had moved past this as Christians. There was a little season where I thought, you know what, I think grace is winning. I think, I think people are starting to believe God is a loving God and they're starting to accept people where they are and just love them. And then all of a sudden, we took a sharp turn. And never before in my young life, I'm 46 years old, never before have I seen us so interested in how other people live their lives. How they look, how they act, who they are, what they do, what they do in public, what they do in private. More so in my life than ever before, we're making a push to make things illegal or off limits. All in the, in many times in the name of moral decency or in the name of God. Trying to fix how people live because that's what God put us here to do. Because we have the idea that the kingdom is actually built by the church. And that it's built by putting up high walls and standards. And high standards will give us a definition of of looking like the God of heaven. We don't build the kingdom. We're in the kingdom. We just love out of it. Or we shut the door from people getting in. And we shut the door because we put the emphasis on the doing of stuff more than on the loving of those who are wounded and hurting and dying. And in almost every house in America, almost every Christian house in America, you can find a real good, hearty, solid amen for preaching high moral standards. But you can get yourself into an absolute knockdown dogfight over what it means to love the unlovable. I've never seen the church at that level to where we can have long and arduous discussions of what it would mean to love when Jesus and Paul and James all agreed it would cover the gamut of the whole thing if we loved our neighbor. Amen. Now, loving God with all your heart, strength, soul, mind, as far as I'm concerned, is absolutely impossible. I would love to love God with all of my heart, soul, strength, mind, and soul. I aspire to it. But how do I do that? Jesus gives us in John 13 the great commandment. He says, a new commandment I give you. Love one another as I've loved you. Okay, so that's a great place to start. Love other people the way Jesus loves me. That would be how I could love God. But don't dismiss the fact that loving God is the step in to loving people. So simply giving people 
a blanket hug is not necessarily a response to people because I love God. It could be a response to people because I feel bad. Like I feel, I re, I've been made to feel guilty about my place in life, so I'm going to turn to other people and embrace them. And that's not a love inspired by loving God. It's a love inspired by feeling bad. We're better than that. We're in the kingdom. So start with what it looks like to love God and listen to what it looks like to love God in Jesus because proof that we love God is that we love our neighbor. Proof that we love our neighbor is that we love our enemy. For Jesus comes along and says, it's easy for you to love the one that loves you back. I say to you, love your enemy. Pray for him who persecutes you. Smite you on the cheek, turn to him the other. Ask you to carry it a mile, carry it too. What's Jesus doing? He's simply trying to define what it looks like to love the other. When we love, we enter the kingdom. We live the kingdom out. When we prioritize doing as the definition of our salvation, doing the goods, doing the morality, doing the principles, doing religion, we prioritize the doing over the love. We shut the door of understanding what the kingdom is. I think it's possible that Jesus is to the Torah what Shema was to the law. Let me, let me explain. God gives the law in Exodus. Exodus, boom, top of Sinai, Ten Commandments, and all of the peripheral commandments start to come out of that. You could almost look at it like ripples rolling down a hill from Sinai. Okay, that's Exodus. The Shema, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. Jesus said that's the greatest commandment. That doesn't come until Deuteronomy. Let's, let's, let's do a little elementary math here. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. What comes first? The Ten Commandments or Deuteronomy? Ten Commandments. Two comes before five. Okay, basic, simple kindergarten math, right? Ten Commandments, the law that comes down Sinai comes long before God codifies it all in one statement. Because actually what Deuteronomy is, is Deuteronomy is a retelling of the law. Here's a fun little Sunday afternoon project. Go home and read the book of Deuteronomy. You go, your idea of fun and my idea of fun, Pastor Paul, are two entirely different things. And for that, I probably would agree. But give it a try sometime and what you will find is that the book of deuteronomy is moses retelling israel what he told them in genesis exodus leviticus and numbers you go well that sounds like real high quality reading a good old-fashioned retelling let's reshoot this tv show but what actually happens in deuteronomy is that moses comes along in deuteronomy it's years later it's 40 years after it first happened all right one two three four five two giving the law Three, four, five, 40 years later. Big gap, whole generation. Bunch of people are dead, weren't around the first time. So when he re-preaches the sermon, because sometimes you got to re-preach the sermon to a new crowd, when he re-preaches the sermon to a new crowd, he puts some new stuff in there. He's listening to God, putting new stuff. What's he put in there? Shema, love the Lord your God with all your heart. That's not back here in Exodus. That's up here in Deuteronomy. What's that tell me? That tells me that as Israel for a generation took the law, they messed it up. They thought that if they lived it, it would make them righteous. But what it was actually supposed to do was Shema. It was supposed to be the definition for how to love God and how to love your neighbor. If you, because if you love your neighbor, you're not going to commit adultery, murder, steal, covet. Get it? I mean, if you do those things, you hate your neighbor. The one you're doing it to, you can't stand that guy. That's why you break those five commandments. You love them, you don't do them. Doing them equivalent to, to hating our neighbor, but what we've done is taken the doing or the not doing and made it righteous. Jesus comes along, flips that on his head, go, I'll be what makes you righteous. Here's Jesus. I'll be what makes you righteous. You go love your neighbor. Love my father. Receive my love. Love your neighbor. What if Jesus is to the law what Shema was to the law. Shema is, here's what the law was trying to do. What if Jesus is what the law was trying to do? And if you'll accept Jesus, what you're accepting is the fullest expression of what it means to love God 
And if you'll accept Jesus, what you're doing is entering into an agreement that you'll love the people he loves. And if that's the case, then you're left with one thing. You get to be the arbiter this week in your life about who Jesus won't love. So you get to go to your work and your school and your home and your next door neighbor and you get to check off all of the people who disqualify to be loved by Jesus. And you can use any criteria you want because the only thing that matters in the end is that it's got to look like Jesus. That's it. It's got to look like Jesus. You got to love like Jesus. It's got to talk like Jesus. It's got to receive them like Jesus. So if you can find them and Jesus wouldn't love them, then you can write them down. You can marginalize them, distance them, ignore them, crush them, hate them, forget about them, and consider them demon spawn. Permission granted. How many pieces of paper you need? See, this is still the great challenge of following Jesus. This is still the great challenge of following Jesus, is to take the Jesus I know and see him in my neighbor. You go, I can't see him in my neighbor. My neighbor's a snake. Right? I'm being serious. Yeah, your neighbor probably is a snake. Are you ready? How, how do we do that? Okay, here's some practical. What do you do if your neighbor's a snake? Jesus said to Nicodemus, I must become like Moses' snake on the pole. I'll become the snake and they'll hang me up on a pole and everyone that looks at me can have life. What Jesus is saying is every time you see the snake in someone else, see that I have been the snake for them and then figure out if you can love them. And that becomes daily Christian living. That becomes, no, I don't like this guy. In fact, I can't stand him. He's a snake. But you know what? Jesus became the snake. Jesus stepped into this man's sin, his nastiness, his rottenness, his filth and his pain. He stepped into it. He didn't just take it like baggage. He became it. What Paul say? God made him who knew no sin to be sin so that we might be made the righteous of God in Christ. God made him who knew no sin. God made him who had never been a snake to be a snake so that all of our snake bites could be found in Jesus' body. God made him who had done nothing as stupid as I've done, but he made him into all the stupid things I've done so that I could be made all of the glorious things he is. But not only so that I could be made all the glorious things he is, but so that I could love that stinking guy. So that I could love that woman. So that I could love that enemy. So that I could love them. So that it's possible to love them, because it's impossible without Jesus. But with Jesus, it becomes possible. It not only becomes possible, it becomes my royal law. Now, you can ignore all of this if you're not yet in the kingdom, because who cares, right? You can just be close to the kingdom, and I'll see you on the other side. And unfortunately, I'm worried that we have that branch springing up off the Christian tree. And I'm really afraid it's been called grace. That it really doesn't matter how you treat your neighbor. In the end, you're going to go to heaven anyway, because you're righteous. And that has pushed the kingdom off to the glory land. And I beg you to repent the kingdoms at hand. Because our hope for this world is not another set of laws and rules and regulations and who gets to do what and why they can't do it. Our hope is to love them like Jesus. Yes. Jesus said, the well don't need a doctor, the sick do. Right. And every person I look at myself included, has a little sickness of this society and this age and this world in them. You go, don't, Pastor, you don't have to say that about me. I'm the righteousness of God in Christ. I know. I know. In Christ, you are the righteousness of God. Absolutely. In your relation with your neighbor, you're a little snaky. In the way you treat your, 
Are you, you with me now? Oh, yeah. Oh, I know in Christ you are right. I mean, I believe that with all of my heart. In Christ, you are absolutely the righteousness of God. I'll shout it. I'll go down. I'll die on that hill that in Christ you are incorruptible. So let that come out when you talk to your neighbor. Release that when you go to your job. Live that when you're around those that that's difficult. That's our call. That's our call. Not far from the kingdom. I, I'd say you're not even not far from the kingdom you're in. If you love who Jesus loves. Father, thank you for the revelation of your love that we aspire to live out. We don't have anything figured out or conquered there are so many moments in my life that I don't even have to ask if I just love like Jesus. I'm positive in the moment I'm not loving like Jesus. I'm positive. And I know that you don't declare me unrighteous and cut me off from your love in those moments. But I also know that the Holy Spirit in me reminds me of how much my Jesus loves me. Not so that I can feel better about my lack of love, but so that I can learn how to love people the way my Jesus loves me. Father, we're not far from the kingdom when we express this love. Teach us and may we learn to listen. Teach us every day what it looks like to live out this love. And let it begin today. As a challenge, let it begin today. In Jesus' name. And if you are looking to love like Jesus, seal it with the amen.